Welcome to PeopleForce Podcast by Trinet. I'm your host, Michael Mendenhall. Trinet is a full-service HR solutions company committed to empowering small and medium-sized businesses by supporting their growth and enabling their people. We work with amazing small to medium-sized businesses, and I'm excited to bring their voices to life right here. You can catch new episodes of PeopleForce Podcast every month on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and rise.trinet.com. Today, we are thrilled to introduce Mike Kurtz, the mastermind behind the culinary sensation Mike's Hot Honey. As the founder and the creator of this beloved brand, Mike has revolutionized the way we experience food with his unique blend of honey infused with chili peppers. What started as a passion project in his own kitchen has blossomed into a global phenomenon. This is adored by food enthusiasts and chefs alike and sold in over 30,000 retail locations. Join us as we uncover the story behind Mike's Hot Honey and explore the spicy journey of this visionary founder, Mike Kurtz. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Well, this is quite fun because we're going to be talking about condiments, music, and I think some other things that are in your past that are very interesting that are going to relate to how you got here. Certainly, this is a 20-year journey, but there's a lot that goes into that, um, a lot of sort of curves and turns and 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 figuring out how you scale something like this. So I want to go back to your childhood, and we'll say maybe high school. Um, you were employed um, and were working as a dishwasher. Talk to us about that and how that helped you sort of define what you wanted to do. Yeah, so my, my first job was age 13. I was a dishwasher at Amherst College Dining Services in Amherst, Mass. I grew up in Amherst. It's a college town. So, um, yeah, I was washing dishes at the dining hall, um, and I eventually got promoted to prep and, you know, started getting into kitchen. Was prep. that exciting? I mean, well, I was you got working... got the promotion? <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was working the French toast station, so I had a flat-top grill and about 60 uh, pieces of French toast going at one time, and... Um, I loved it. Yeah, you know, I think I was making about five twenty-five an hour at the time. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was sort of the beginning of my food service experience. And you know, I later worked as a delivery driver in high school and college, in what was sort of the precursor miniature version of what you know DoorDash and Grubhub became. But it was we had CB radios on our cars and uh, this is before the iPhone. So we had our map books. And, and to think what you could have done with that service saying, why don't we scale this like they did with Airbnb, right? <laughs> yeah. I think nobody really was thinking that that big at the time, yeah. but they certainly had the model early on. Well, what were you um, studying in college? I mean, what did, what was sort of your, your goal? You were, what were you driving toward? Uh, or was it one where you're like, Hey, I'm liberal arts and I'm going to try to figure it out. Yeah, so um, just going back a little bit, my parents met in Brazil. So my my dad is from Philadelphia, my mom's from D.C., but they both met in Brazil. So I had this connection to Brazil growing up. Uh, my dad was drafted to fight in the Vietnam War, was opposed to the war, and found out that he could fulfill his civil service by joining the Peace Corps. So he joined the Peace Corps in 1964 and was randomly chosen to be stationed in Brazil. So he was in Brazil for a few years, and later he was um, getting a master's in Portuguese and led a group of undergrad students on a trip to Brazil um, during the summertime. And my mom was one of the students on the trip, and they met there, fell in love, and, you know. So I had this and connection. And here you are. <laughs> I, here I am. So I had this connection to Brazil growing up and um, uh, loved Brazilian music and, you know, heard the language a lot growing up um, around my dad and um he exposed me to a lot of Brazilian music. So I was really into music, um, and I ended up uh, being a triple major in college. I, I triple majored in Portuguese, African-American studies, and ethnomusicology. Wow. So well, that's a that's a whole – where would you go for that? <laughs> I so, mean, that, that seems very unique and specific. Yeah. Um, well, I did my freshman year of college at University of Wisconsin in Madison, um, where I actually met my now business partner, Matt Beaton. He was a, a freshman in the same dorm, uh, dorm as I was. And so I had that connection um, from my freshman, freshman year of college, but I ended up transferring back to UMass 
um, for my sophomore year, I just realized I was racking up out of state tuition and oh. a state school is a state school, at, yeah. you know, at a certain, certain level. And so I, I ended up coming back to UMass and, uh, um, I was really interested in studying ethnomusicology, but there wasn't an ethnomusicology program at UMass, but they had an option to sort of create your own major. Did you, have you produced music, mastered music, um, written music? Yeah, I, uh, so after college, so my, my, my senior thesis in college was about the development of hip hop music in Brazil. Um, and then after college, I, I, my first job out of college, um, I was hired for a job in the music business working at a record label called Putumayo World Music, which was on Lafayette Street about a block south of Astor Place. And I got hired for a job in the record sales department selling CDs. So this was like, you know, the tail end of the, the golden era of the music business. Yeah, when yeah. <laughs> Tower Records was still in business and, you know, people were still going out and buying CDs. And Putumayo was putting out compilations of music from different countries every month. So we would have, it was sort of like an introduction to the music of that place. Um, and I uh, worked in record sales and then I got promoted to A&R and production. I worked on the, the production of a number of those albums and the mastering of the albums, the, the, the writing of the copy for the liner notes. Um, hmm. I shared an office with the lawyer from the label who... Um, was negotiating all, the, all of the contracts, so I sort of learned a little bit from him about uh, music supervision, music licensing. Mm -hmm. And then after um, my time there, I ended up working as a music supervisor for licensing music for television and film. Oh, with, with a network or cable or? I worked for a, a pr production company that was producing like small independent films. Um, and then uh, I worked on one feature film called Billy Bates, which was produced by mm. Julie Pacino, as Al Pacino's daughter, Julie. It was her first um, first feature film that she produced. Um, and, you know, that was sort of the tail end of my 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 career in the music business. I, I also play music. I play piano and, you know, I like to like to play music. We never did that professionally. Yeah. But so you, that, now you've got. A turn here, a right turn. So, yeah. so now that ends, or sort of slowly, you know, dissipates, and now you go into condiments. Now, a lot of that has to do with the connection with Brazil, right? So, yeah. when did you decide, like, you know what, uh, this condiment thing is interesting, um, and where did that idea come from, and in what part of your life did that happen? So my freshman year in college, um, I met Larry, Larry Raymond, who is Sweet Baby Ray. Um, Amazing barbecue sauce. Yeah. Probably heard of the barbecue sauce. And, you know, I thought, wow, this is like, this guy's great. You know, like, and, you know, the life of a condiment man. Like, this sounds like <laughs> something I could really, really uh, get into here. And so so I, I sort of had that in the back of my mind. And then... Um, that was my freshman year of college. And then uh, my junior year, I was studying abroad in Brazil. I went to visit this national park and was hiking for like five days in this national park with a group of friends. And on the last day of the hike, we descended into this little valley, very remote valley. And um, there was a little town there. And we were we had been camping for five days, just eating rice and beans every night over the campfire. So we were delighted when we found this pizzeria. And they had jars of honey with chili peppers for drizzling on the pizzas. Not, there. not, not, not this one, everyone. No. Not that one. Not but this it one. Was, <laughs> it was definitely the seed, um, you know, and the, the inspiration mm -hmm. for what later became Mike's Hot Honey. And and so, you know, I just loved the combination of the chili peppers and the honey and the taste of, of both of those on the pizza. And well, you brought this to the U.S. So I, I came back uh, to the States a year later, and I, I just started experimenting with honey chili pepper infusions in my college apartment, my senior year of college. So that was, that was 2004. And um, so, yeah, 20 years ago. Uh, and I tested a bunch of different techniques for infusing chili peppers into honey and different varietals of chili until I landed on uh, the recipe that we really still use today. So... Um, that was is that a hidden recipe? It is a secret. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a trade secret. Um, secret. There's a secret sauce. It's a secret. <laughs> you know, we 
we basically make a single product. You know, we have this yeah. company that's built based it's essentially on one product. So we got to keep it close to the vest. But now, so I want to get into then the the manufacturing piece of yeah. this. So so it's twenty years ago. Yeah, you're you're selling it out of the back of a pizza pizza joint, right? I had been experimenting with it. I, I moved to New York. I had started that job in the music business. And I just started making this as a hobby. Um, and in 2010, I had gotten really into making pizza. And I went to Pauly G's, which is a Neapolitan-style wood-fired pizzeria in Brooklyn, which was close to where I lived at the time. And, and I went there. Um, the restaurant had just opened. And I met Pauly, the owner. And came by the table and I started peppering him with questions about his oven and um, his dough recipe. And he could tell that I was really into making pizza. So he um, he asked if I wanted to come in after my day job and become a, a pizza apprentice. So at, at the time, I was working as an assistant to a booking agent at a ICM, a booking agency in Midtown yeah. Manhattan. And um, I had just started there. And um, you know, I was on this track to be an assistant to an to an agent for you know maybe five years, well, and then a, eventually that's a whole different track. <laughs> right, it's a very it's a completely different, completely different career path. But um, you know, I was I was doing that, and 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 I was going into the pizzeria at night, practicing stretching dough, learning how to make pizzas, and um, I brought in a bottle of my honey for Polly to try, and he he liked it, and at the time, you know, it wasn't branded there was no packaging um it had the name mike's hot honey that that name is now 20 years old but um you know there was no brand around it um and he liked it and asked if i could make enough for the restaurant so i started drizzling it on the pizzas there in the summer of 2010 and at the time the restaurant was you know it was new it was like this hot spot in the neighborhood and where did you get the capital to start doing this are you just using sort of your 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 paycheck your to, to, to fund making the honey and bringing it into the, the, the pizza parlor? Yeah, I mean, I, I started the, the business with 150 bucks. You know, there was no capital. Um, yeah. But I, uh, yeah, I was uh, bartering kitchen space um, for, for honey. So um, I needed a commercial kitchen to produce it. So I started, um, you know, eventually I... I had... and, and didn't you also, so you, you, you were talking about the peppers, yeah. right? And what type of peppers? But there's also the types of honey. Yes. Because they're all there's a variety of that too. Right. So did you also look at like well what kind of honey and from where? Yeah. So honey takes on the flavor profile of the of the the nectar from the flower that the bees are collecting nectar from. So you know orange blossom honey bees are collecting yeah nectar from the orange blossom and the honey tastes like an orange yeah. Um, so yeah, I tasted a lot of different types of honey. Um, I ended up settling on a New York wildflower honey. Um, honey is a natural product with natural variation. So yeah. I think like it, I sort of embraced the fact that there was going to be a little bit of variation yeah. in the flavor profile, yeah. you know, from season to season. But I found a supplier from upstate New York and and started using his his honey for the product. How many gallons of honey are you going through? I mean, this is, you, you're lots of honey. I mean, a lots, lot. A lot of bees. <laughs> a, a lot, yeah. I mean, a, you know, a single hive, um, usually it'll produce, you know, around 60 pounds of honey, depending. I mean, oftentimes it's related to how much rainfall you get. So if it's a rainy spring, um, you know, you're, you're more likely to have a higher yield than if it's a really dry spring. The, the, the flowers produce less nectar. The bees collect less, less nectar, produce less honey. So you have to be because you're really your your basic piece to this is the honey. Mm -hmm. You have to be very involved in you know what's going on right now with honeybees and some of the the I don't know if it's an aphid or something that's infecting the hives and you know that that you varroa know, mites. Yeah, varroa mites. That's what yes. it is. Yeah, yeah. So they will. Um... You know, they they often impact larger scale operations um, where the hives tend to be closer together. So you know, um, interesting uh, Flex, the company Flex, who does all the smart technology work. You know, your your they do all the wristbands for you know everybody who's got wearable technology, mm -hmm. and they worked on a project where um, it was uh, addressing this issue, and they the scientists figured out that. 
and if they heat the hive to a certain temperature, the bees can survive, but not the mites. And so they heat, they, they produce more heat. They actually wrap the thing with electrodes and they heat the hive up. And, and the bees are protected and it kills, just so you know. Um, that was a really interesting article. But that, that being said, so are your suppliers local? Are they, is, is, or is it really your, the, the peppers are coming from Mexico or wherever and the honey's coming from, as you think about your supply chain? Yeah. yeah, so you know we've we've grown quite a bit since yes. the, the early days. Um, uh, today we still work with our original supplier, um, and we have started to supplement our 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 New York supply with honey from uh, Brazil, Argentina, and Uruguay. Oh, wow. So oh. we're using, yeah, we're using honey from the United States as well as Brazil, Uruguay, and Argentina. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What 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 hiccups have you had as you scale? Now you've got to figure out, like, we need different types of equipment. We need different types of people who have different levels of experience in doing this, you know, in producing condiments or, or producing a food product or byproduct. Do you, have you had hiccups as you grow? Like, oh, wow, now we've got to grow bigger. We have to do this. And what were some of maybe, were there uh, roadblocks that you had to get over and figure out? Yeah, there have been a number. Um you know, early on, I was a one-man operation the first five years, and I was personally bottling every bottle by hand. Um, it took a really long time to unlock large-scale production. Um, one of the issues is that I was looking for a, a honey packer who was willing to work with me, and I, I posed a risk to most honey packers because they weren't going to set up a separate line for my product because I was too small. And they also didn't want to run chili pepper infused honey on a line that also packs pure honey because if you clean the line but you miss a spot, you run you run the risk of cross contaminating. Yeah. Oh yeah. Pure honey with chili peppers, and as you know, honey is a very precious commodity. So. Oh yeah. I just wasn't worth the risk for all of these packers, so I struck out with a lot of people, um, and it took years to finally find somebody who was willing to take a chance on me and who, who actually believed in the product. And so when I finally found the, the, the first packer that I, I started working with, he had a garage in, in North Jersey and he had hives in upstate New York. And he said, you know, when, you know, I don't want you to be alarmed when you get here, you know, it, it doesn't look like much, but I assure you, like we can do a lot of production out of this very small space. And he worked with me to sort of MacGyver, uh, a production line, you know, because yeah. that we were creating a product in a category that didn't yet exist. So there was no template for how to produce this stuff at scale. So we had really had to figure out the machinery needed to execute the production process mm. at scale. And then, you know, eventually we, we figured it out. And, you know, a few years later, we were able to do, I think he, he filled an order out of that same garage for like, 4,000 Walmart stores two weeks early. So, like, he... Oh, wow. He, oh, really, he really was was true to his word. Well, it was, so tell me then about how you scaled. So you were a person. Yep. Then what, did you go to 10, 15, and then all of a sudden you're at, like, 50? Uh, how, how did you scale over the 20 years? Yeah, so it was a one-man operation from, like, 2010 to 2015, and then um, I was looking for uh, a business partner to help me grow the business, and... I had a serendipitously re reconnected with my business partner, Matt, who I had met my freshman year of college, and he reached out. He was coming to New York um, with his, his, his wife, and I uh, hadn't seen him, you know, since freshman year of college, so it had been, you know, about 15 years, and I brought him to Poly G's, and he had pizza, and he saw the honey, and I, I filled him in on what I was doing, and he was, he had a corporate job, and he was looking to get out of his, his job and into a mm. startup at the time, and he had an MBA and some some really great um, business experience that complemented my experience, and and we were just a good good pair. So he ended up joining me as a as a partner in 2015. We then started um, grooming the business to take on our first investment. Um, we we had a, a Series A mm. seed round in 2017. After that, um, we were able to hire you know a handful of people. Um, and started scaling from there. So, you know, the 
the Series A really gave us, you know, the the have gas you, to to start hiring. Some, have you some had people. Have you had any of these bigger conglomerates decide? Well, we're already making honey over here. Let's let's try to take a piece of this market share from Mike, and we'll try to do this. Have you had competitors try to come in and? Yeah, I mean, there. I think our our biggest competition is private label. So mm. you see, mm. like, um, you know. A lot of the grocery store chains have their own sort of private label version of our product, but even despite a, a lower price point, we tend to perform well, this is, better. Well, this is all about you, right? Because yours has a personality versus some white label thing. It's like, yeah, okay. I mean, this is a cool story behind this, right? It's it's yeah. there's there's a real brand with real people behind it, and also uh, the. What's in the bottle is really high quality, and, yeah. and and you know maybe someday our competitors will will be able to replicate it, but so far no one has. No, that no, that's usually the case as long as you stay true. But you you have you have two here. We'll come back to that. So um, so now you you've gone from I don't know what was it? Did you say one hundred and twenty dollars you started with, and you're well into the tens of millions. Is that correct? I don't know that you you've been public about you know, the size and the growth and the scale of that. Yeah, we, we did over 30 million in, in sales last year. And, um, you know, we continue to grow at a pretty good clip. Yeah, that's fantastic. And when did you introduce? So you have the original. Now you have the extra hot. The, the extra By the hot. way, he said there's there are two different types of peppers. So it's not like just more pepper in this. It's a different type of pepper. Yeah, and that's important because different chili peppers hit on different parts of the palate. So yeah. The original is a little bit more of a back of the palate heat. The extra hot, um, the black bottle, is a lot more um, punch in the front of the palate. Um, cuts through fattier foods. So, like, I would recommend the extra hot for something like ribs um, or fried chicken. The original is a little bit more delicate. Um, you could put it in, in a cocktail or mm. drizzle it on some cheese. Or, but really, it's all it's all depends on the person. No, that's so. So, are you international? Are you global? Or are you really U.S. based so far? We're mostly focus on, focusing on our domestic business mm. and really growing our our velocity in the mm. domestic market. But we have um, taken on some international business. Um, you know, Canada, uh, the Middle East, East mm. Asia. So Brazil. Yeah, actually, I was um, going to say you, you you've got this Brazilian connection. Yeah, we we are we are going to be um, expanding our distribution to Brazil um, um, probably later this year. So that that's exciting. It's kind of a full circle moment for me. So how many full time employees do you have today? And today we're at about twenty seven. Oh wow! So two to twenty seven. Yeah. Uh, in the ten years, has that. And does that make it more complicated and does it become more distracting when you add like 30, then you go to 50, then you're like, does it distract you from the business um, in that now you've got other issues you have to deal with? Is it? I mean, it's it's certainly a challenge managing managing people, you know, who have real lives. And um, that's, of course, there are challenges with, with that. But um, ultimately, it's just been just wonderful to build out a team i think like in our case we focused on hiring great people nobody has experience selling hot honey no <laughs> you know it's it's like we're, we're just looking to hire really smart people who are passionate who share our values and um we well, you have a cult you have a culture right which is important yeah and you don't want to disturb that by bringing somebody in that doesn't fit how do you manage that piece of it so one, not just bringing the right people in, but that will fit with your team, keep the culture that you've built around the idea and the brand, mm -hmm. right? And then retain people so that they don't go somewhere else because somebody's offering them more. Yeah. Um, well, we've we've hired a lot of people who have come from connections to our existing staff. Mm. So, you know, it's... You start with great people in the beginning, and then you tap into their networks, and then you start to build the team that way. I think like that's been one way that we've been able to sort of preserve our our culture and hire great people. You know, we were pretty much remote before the pandemic, so that was one thing that helped us hire great talent and compete with some some bigger brands that maybe mm. we couldn't match a salary, but 
you know, we'll offer you maximum flexibility. And, you know, you want to limit your travel? We'll, we'll make that happen. And Have like, benefits help home? that? Because, you know, the biggest thing we see at Trinet is, you know, the healthcare piece and the benefits that you can provide. Have you, has that played into, um, you know, attracting good talent? A- absolutely. I mean, we, we try to be consistent um, and competitive with the best brands out there in terms of our benefits. And, um, you know, we're still a relatively small company, but I think what we offer our staff is, has, has been, um, you know, fairly competitive in that front. So, you know, benefits, flexibility, the ability to work remotely, all of those things help in hiring the best talent. So you were talking about your network and how you find people, your parents, are they into this? I mean, they've always been, (laughs) um, my parents always supported, um, my creative pursuits. And I think that's probably what gave me the confidence to dive headfirst into the hot honey business. Yeah. My family is just like, you know, they're spreading the Mike's Honey Gospel every day. And Do they order cartons of it? Like, hey, send another one. <laughs> I, mean, it's, another I keep on telling family, like, you don't have to buy it. Like, I'll send you some more. But, um, but yeah, I think, like, just in general, like, the, the product and the brand has um, benefited a lot from, like, this organic word of mouth growth. So tell like, me, you know, you were talking about restaurants and a lot of restaurants. What restaurants here that were in New York um, are using this? I mean, there are... All over. Yeah, I mean, we're working with thousands of restaurants across the country um, from, you know, single location But it's not just pizza. To, That's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. You know, people are putting this on things other than pizza. Right? Yeah. So, like, our, our strategy in food service was to start with the tastemakers. So, like, you know, we started out of Poly G's, which was this hotspot Neapolitan-style pizzeria, and a lot of other pizzerias saw the success that Polly was having with the product and, you know, wanted to replicate that success at their spot. So um, we started out with this model of, of tapping into tastemakers, not just in New York City, but like the best pizzerias in every market. And I think part of it is that like I... I was a pizza guy. I worked in a pizzeria, so the pizza community saw me. I'm, I'm sure you you produce great dough. I'm, my dough's that's that's a, that's the most one of the most important I mean, pieces. <laughs> I did. I, I'm a little out of practice now, but at one point I was making pretty good dough. But like I I uh, I think the pizza community really embraced me because they saw me as one of their own, and they saw the product as something that was of the pizza community. So. That really helps. So we, we tapped into tastemakers all over the country. And it's, you know, in New York, it's places like Scar's Pizza on the Lower East Side. which now, is, is that the one you talked about? Because I was going to say, there was one we talked about earlier that you said has some of the best pizza using your hot honey. It's in the Lower East Side. Is that the is Yeah, that the they're, one? they're one of my favorite pizzerias. Um, I mean, they really are my favorite. So t- tell everybody where that is, the name, where it is, where yeah. you can locate this. Scar's Pizza, uh, 35 Orchard Street on the Lower East Side, Orchard and Canal. Um, just a great New York slice shop. If you want a, just a pure New York and slice. And they're using Mike's Hot Honey. Gets. Yeah. Uh, they have a slice called the Hot Boy, which is pepperoni, jalapenos, and Mike's Hot Honey. Oh, wow. Okay. It's got yeah. a kick. Yeah, you're going to need you're gonna need a little beverage with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, listen, this has been awesome. I mean, I, I want to say that, you know, we're very impressed with what you've done. We love that you're a customer. Um, we wanted to highlight this. We think it's important because you've had such growth. We we do like the story that goes with it because uh, a lot of people don't realize success doesn't happen overnight, and it's always a journey. And what we see is a lot of it's eight to ten years till you really see something hit, and it's a lot of sweat, you know, that goes into this sweat equity to make this stuff happen. And we, we're thrilled that we're a part of this too of my hot honey, um, and that you took time to to come in. Um, from Brooklyn to, to be with us. Of course. I mean, it wasn't that far, but I appreciate you guys having having me. And, um, you know, it's just great to have a chance to share the story. And, and uh, of course, we're, we're grateful for the partnership. Yeah, great. Terrific. Well, listen, where are you going after this? Uh, I'm headed to Chicago tomorrow to They're shoot. putting this on Deep Dish? They're, <laughs> we have a partnership <laughs> uh, coming up with Lumonati's which is a, a famous deep dish spot in Chicago. 
Um, so I'm, I'm going out there tomorrow to shoot some content with them. That's awesome. Well, everybody, go out and get some Mike's Hot Honey. I, I, I would stick with sort of the original version for me, but, but you know, go for it if you're doing some brisket. <laughs> to, e- to each their own. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I want to remind everybody that our People Force podcast by Trinet is committed to helping small businesses and their leaders with timely and relevant business content. The People Force podcast drops new episodes every month. And we hope you continue catching our new episodes on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and rise.trinet.com. To get relevant SMB news and info, make sure you subscribe to our podcast and to our newsletter at trinet.com backslash insights.